Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Glad to see everyone and as the judge makes his way, I'm gonna go ahead and call to order the Transportation Policy Committee. It's good to see everyone here. And we've got a, got a handful of folks, so I would say, uh, just want the com confirmation that we have a quorum present. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. The next thing in line, I, I gather that everyone has their agenda and packet in front of them. And I have a movement, uh, it's been moved to approve the agenda for today. Second. Second, thank you so much. Uh, do I need to vote on that? Yes, carry it. All righty, those in, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. All righty, thank you so much. Uh, the other items, safety procedures, and we have an area for public comment and acknowledging guests. What I'd like to do at this time, if it's okay, is that go ahead and acknowledge our guests this morning from uh, a wonderful group of folks. I wanted to take this time to allow them to introduce themselves so as they come forward next time, we can go ahead and get involved if you'd like to do so. Make your way to the podium if you would, please. And if you'd like just want somebody to introduce you all, that'll be good. <laughs> good morning. My name is Tammy Fontenot, and I am the model program manager for transportation planning and division and tech stock. And I'm here to deliver the travel demand model. Glad to have you. Good morning, Jonathan Abner. I'm with WRA. Uh, we're the consultant that was working with TxDOT and the MPO to develop the model. So look forward to presenting some information to you shortly. Thank you so much for being here. And I think you have a tag team back there with you as well. Yeah, so. we them in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. At this moment, if we'll, uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes from January 17th, 2023. Mm -hmm. All those in favor of approving the minutes from January 17th, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. All righty, motion carries. Our next item, uh, item six, to discuss and take appropriate action regarding the resolution 202303. And Mr. Jones, I believe you're gonna kick this thing off, if you would, please. Yes, ma'am, good morning. Good morning. As I noted in your agenda backup, CityBus is required by federal law to establish performance targets for the mandated transit asset management plan, the, the TAM, and the Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan, the PTAS, because they receive federal funds under FTA's Urbanized Area Formula Grant Program 5307. Both of these operating plans reinforce operational safety and asset preservation. They are basically a safety risk management tool and a safety risk mitigation strategy. The review and update of the strategies and the targets is on a federally mandated timeline. The transit titles in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act require the transit provider to cooperate and coordinate with the MPO to ensure that the targets and the 3C planning process are enrolled in the MPO's long-range plan and four-year TIP. The new law requires the safety plan to be updated annually, but the asset management plan has a four-year sunset, so we are taking this opportunity to reaffirm those targets at a mid-cycle milestone for transparency. What we are asking you to do here is to demonstrate to TxDOT that cooperation and coordination uh, by ratifying the action taken by the Lubbock Transit Advisory Board at their February meeting by approving the resolution to support and reaffirm their actions to amend and update these targets. The MPO takeaway here is that the MPO resolves to program these targets into our project selection process in order to contribute 
to the achievement of the performance measures. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Chris, and he's going to hit the highlights of the targets for you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. You did such a great job introducing <laughs> that. So I will just be very, very brief. On page 19 of the, of the backup is our targets for the uh, PTASP, or the Transit Agency Safety Plan. And the targets that are listed here, uh, to, to get a commonality amongst all training systems, it's all based upon a million revenue miles. So uh, if you look underneath the, the top box there, fixed route, safety performance targets, uh, underneath injuries, there's 3.2, which is the baseline. And so we've set a target for 3.1 per million revenue miles of service. Same thing for, for safety events. Safety events are those that are reported to the National Transit Database, uh, fatalities, uh, major accidents, vehicles that end up with disabling damage, um, et cetera. Uh, and so those are listed there. And then the mean distance between ma major mechanical failures, same thing. Uh, it's we, we have a target of 50, uh, uh, one major mechanical failure per uh, 50,000 miles of the million revenue miles per uh, per year. Same thing, so we have to split that out between fixed route and demand response, which demand response is our paratransit and on-demand service. So those are set at uh, 1.9 uh, for injuries, 1.5 for safety events, 47,000 mean distance between major mechanical failures. So that's the uh, PTAS targets. And then on the page 20, it is the uh, transit asset management plan targets. Uh, this is a document that we have to utilize and kind of look at what we've done current year and then project to look at funding for upcoming year and then kind of project out what are the, uh, the assets that we control, uh, how we replace those and keep those within a state of good repair. Uh, so for 23, which is our current year, we've set a uh, bus rolling stock target for 63% or just under 63% of our all, all vehicles being under the useful life, useful life benchmark, which is 14 years. Those are for the big uh, heavy or big bus um, buses there. And then, um, so the good news about this is our cutaway vans. <clears throat> which are the vans we do paratransit and on demand with. In, in previous years, we have uh, been upwards of 60, 70% of those vehicles being in excess of their uf useful life benchmark, which is set at 10 years. And uh, through the good the, the council giving us the approval to purchase vehicles over the last couple of years, we've gotten that down to zero. So that is the uh, a really good target that we've, or, and we can maintain that 0% target going forward. Uh, and then you've jumped down to the bottom. Uh, we have to provide a uh, asset rating for our facilities. And so basically if you keep it at or above a three on a one to five uh, scale, you, you, you don't have to do any other reporting mechanism on that. But if it falls below a three, you do have to tell FTA what you're gonna do to uh, repair the facilities and maintain it in a good state of good repair. So there has to be a, a funding mechanism there. Our facilities are livable and they are working. So we have those rated at three and we actually had the city of Lubbock facilities department come out and do a, an assessment of the entire facility. And this is what they uh, rated that on. So we'll be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Are there any questions? Anyone on the dais? So you're just asking us to approve uh, Agree with you on the targets, am I correct? Yes, ma'am. This has to be put into the uh, the MPO's tip, step, long range planning process as far as the planning tool. So, yes, ma'am. Yeah. I'd entertain a motion to uh, approve item number six on the agenda. Second. Thank you so much. Uh, the, all those in uh, favor of approving this item say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Thank you very much. Item number seven, Mr. Jones. There isn't really much to add to the discussion that's written in your agenda backup, except to reemphasize that we are just memorializing what Region 6 FTA, Tech TP, and P, and the MPO have agreed to to help City Bus keep their purchasing process alive and save their production spot, spot for their 5339 buses that they're going to buy with, with their new grant uh, money. The resolution in your backup authorizes us to change the STIP portal 
and text.connect, resulting in basically an administrative amendment without the collateral documentation and board action that would occur with that process so that they can keep their place in line and get those buses ordered. Um, that's all we're doing, and Chris may want to add some comment to that as well. So we had in this, this is uh, for our, the award that we got for the 39.6 million in the 5339C low and no emission grant program last year. And we had 17 million programmed in that year's uh, tip. And so uh, FTA allows us to spend up to that 17 million that we have programmed. And therefore we have to get the, the rest of the, the tip amended to add that extra funding in there so that we can continue to spend on that. So this is a, uh, they allow us to do kind of an administrative amendment so long as they're replacement buses and not additions to fleet. And so we are using this funding to do replacement buses, so therefore they're saying it should be an administrative amendment to add that extra funding to the tip. Is that 39 buses, That my understanding? I'm sorry? What's the total of buses? So it's going to be somewhere between 48 and 50. 48 and 50. Okay. okay. Thank you. Any questions of Mr. Jones or Mr. Mandrell? No? Hearing none, I'd call for a motion to approve resolution 2023-4. Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Those opposed, same sign. Thank you so much. We're moving on. Mr. Jones, item number eight, please. <laughs> Thank you. Item number eight, performance measures are a fairly common discussion anymore particularly at the MPO level. The performance management program is a federally implemented and managed program required by the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. The purpose of the program is to use the performance measures and targets to measure how effective and how efficient our transportation network is. The agenda, uh, th this agenda item deals with the pavement and bridge conditions otherwise known as PM2. <laughs> you acted on PM1, which was all the safety performance measures at your, at your last meeting. This is a core federal aid support program that measures the condition and performance of the national highway system in Lubbock County. You have, a, you have a handout at each of your places. It's a black and white map of the county that shows the national highway system, just so you know what, what highways we're talking about in Lubbock County. The district and the MPO planning area boundary. The six criteria that are measured with PM2 are listed on page 27 and 28 in your backup. They measure the condition of pavements on and off the interstate system, including bridge decks on and off the system. As with the other performance measures, uh, measure requirements, the Lubbock MPO has chosen to follow and support the targets that are set by the commission rather than developing our own and collecting and managing that, that support data. The targets are listed on page 34 and basically show a slight improvement in the interstate pavements in, in good condition and some improvement in poor condition. Bridge decks don't show as much improvement, but still in good shape. Texas, I have, if I can get to it, find it now but anyway I had a I had a little map to show but uh, Texas as far as bridges are concerned Texas it's right there there we go Texas has about 54,488 bridges in the inventory, and that's about 26,000 more than any other state in the United States, and more than the combined inventory of 17 states. Over 35,600 35, bridges are on the state system, and over 18,800 are off system on city streets, county roads, etc. 
Texas also has 24 international bridges that are open to traffic between Texas and Mexico. There are about 475 bridges in the district and 226 or 47% are in Lubbock County. There are three bridges in the county in poor condition, or not in the county, but in the district, in poor condition. Two are in Lubbock County, that's the Yucca Street Bridge and the bridge over the spillway at Buffalo Springs. And the other one is in Garza County. All the bridges in Lubbock County, 90.3% are in good or fair condition, according to the scoring matrix. Statewide bridges are scored overall at 88.3% good, but the commission wants to move that score up to 90, so we are working towards that, towards that goal. The average age of our bridges is about 45 to 50 years old for those that are on system, and 35 to 45 years old for those that are off system. All bridges are inspected, at least in Texas, every two years. You can, see, you can see the number of bridges on the little map, although it's not real plain, I apologize for that. Uh, there and on the, on the matrix to the, to the left, you can see what the condition of the bridges is over time, going back to 2011 through 2023, which showing 42% are all good, 56% are in fair, and only uh, less than 1% are in poor condition. The summary of that is to say that Lubbock District meets their targets, and we were following, still following TxDOT's lead, and I would ask your support to approve that resolution. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Any questions or comments? None? If none, I'll call for a motion to approve these adjustment, adjusted targets and approve the res resolution. Move for approval. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries in. Item number nine, Mr. Jones. Item number nine has the same purpose and background as the PM2 measures. System performance measures, or PM3, require state DOTs to establish targets for six system performance criteria intended to assess performance again on the national highway system. These targets measure pedestrian and freight movement on the interstate system as well as congestion and air quality. However, since the city, county, and MPO enjoy an attainment certification for air quality, we are exempt from having to perform any air quality control. Collectively, the data is supposed to help people estimate travel time and reliability so they can avoid delays and go where they need to go effectively, efficiently, day in and day out. There are only three applicable measures that apply to the MPO. Those are one through three and listed on page 35 and 36 in your backup. And remember, we are exempt, exempt from four through six, which are the CMAC measures. You can see from the targets on page 39 that we are continuing to monitor our 22 forecast as this is the midterm report cycle with no adjustment necessary to 23 and still, but it's still a reportable uh, event per the guidance. So I would ask again your support for the resolution that, that monitors the 22 targets. There are no questions or concerns. I'll entertain a motion to approve this resolution. So moved. Sorry. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. All righty. We're barreling down the highway. No pun intended. <laughs> and again, Mr. Jones, item number 10. And I think we have, Jen is Jennifer here as well? Okay. And Ms. Kylie. Okay. 
Thank Can't you. really add much to what's writ been written in your agenda back up, but the Reader's Digest version of what we are proposing to do here is to move Upland 66th Street to 82nd Street, which has a currently has a May let date to a November let date, and then backfill that spot with Woodrow Phase 1 from a 24, 2024 position. Let them move into that May may let position. Also, the resolution contemplates using some of our commission authorized and allocated Cat 10, Category 10, carbon reduction money to go into a phase of Upland from 82nd to 98th. Now, the, the sponsors for those projects are here, city and county, and I'm sure they would want to comment um, and I'll turn the floor over to them. All righty. Which one of those ladies wanted to stand first? Ms. Kylie? Oh, I'll watch that here. Yeah. Okay. You got it. There's a couple of things on the resolution that need to be changed. Um, it is a Woodrow is being moved to July letting, not May. And then um, the carbon reduction CAT-10 funds are being applied to the Upland 66 to 82nd project. So we've noted that, okay. um, but just so y'all are aware, we will adjust that. So are there any specific questions that y'all would like me to answer about what we're doing with so, amendments? So Tom, I'm looking at the resolution on just to, yeah. Um, on section two, is that is that where we're adjusting? Yeah. Yes. To, so section two is section two to July, July of 2023. Yes, and then and on, on section page, three. On section three, it should say 66 to 82nd. Yes. Instead of 82nd to 98. Yes, and the CSJ is cor correct. It's listed correctly there. And the amounts are correct as well. Yes. Madam Chair, I make a motion to approve resolution. Well, first of all, I move to amend the resolution. Um, and section two, to replace the word May to July of 2023. Mm -hmm. And on section three, to replace 82nd Street to 98th with 66th to 82nd Street. Thank you. Here, have a second. Second. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, no questions. I will call for the question. Um, no, it didn't come um, out right. Call the, for the, the question on, on the, the amendment. amendment. Those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Now and, we and now, will call for the a motion on the amended motion. And now I uh, I make Resolute. a motion to uh, approve resolution twenty. 23-07 as amended. Thank you. All of those in favor, say aye. Second. Oh, Mr. He, gave, second. he gave me a second. That's okay. We'll take you as a third, Mr. Mr. Atkins. <laughs> All of those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say same sign. Thank you so much. I think there are some happy campers on that. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Jones and Mr. Martin. The next agenda item is agenda item number 11, and I want to introduce Jonathan Abner from uh, WRA, and he will present our model update. We're looking for an interesting show. And welcome back, and let's just you can to dive back. on in. Again, I'm here representing TechStot, Transportation Planning and Program Division. We actually work collaboratively with the MPO and to develop a travel demand model that we hope will be able to be used for your plan and transportation planning needs. We work, um, the process is whereby the MPO generally develops the demographics and the network and then TPP builds the model. We actually contracted with CDM Smith and WRA in order to 
develop all of these tasks. So they actually develop the demographics, the networks, and the model. So he's going to be here to develop, to pr provide you a presentation about the model and its output and what you can expect to use it, how you can expect to use it. It is our hope that you will approve this model in your coming meetings. So if you have any questions, we ask that you please ask them today while we're here so that we can respond to them. We're also going to be here for a couple days providing training. We as in, I mean, WRA. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so that you will have a better hands-on and be able to use the model once, you, once we deliver it to you today. So thank you. All righty. Well, thank you. Um, honored to be here with you all this morning uh, talking about something that I'm passionate about. I've been doing this for 20 plus years, but may be new to all of you. Um, so I'm going to attempt to try to demystify the black box, if you will. Um, talk a little bit about what it is, how to use it, what not to use it for, um, and then get into how we actually developed the new model for Lubbock and then how the MPO and the city um, can use it going forward. So lots of things you've already talked about today, some of those performance measures, bridges, et cetera. The models are great tools to help us know what's going to be on those roadways in the future and how to plan for them. So with that, we'll uh, get started. And you know, top of the agenda, what is a travel demand model? Uh, there's so many screens to look at here, sorry. Um, but first of all, let me just say questions, comments, please. Um, hoping we can have some discussion, some dialogue. Would love to answer any questions you have. Um, so please feel free to interrupt me at any time. Martin will as well um, if I'm starting to run long because, again, I do this all the time so I can talk about it for a long time. But I know you have a busy day ahead of you. So with that, what is a travel demand model? Well, it's an important planning tool. Um, help support your long-range plan development, your MTP, which I know you talk a lot about in planning for the future for the region. But it also can be used by the MPO as a tool to help evaluate system improvements, um, how those different projects will have impact on the rest of the system, identify where you have system issues. I know you all drive your system daily. You know where the problems are. But the model is a great tool to help quantify that and document it. Um, it also allows us to conduct alter alternative analysis and ultimately de development of design level traffic, the work that Tammy does at TxDOT with developing the traffic forecast for projects, the model is integral to that process. So brief overview where we're going to head today, uh, a little bit of a background, what is a model, what, we, what you can do with it, how we develop the Lubbock model, and then some examples of how you can use it and some of the information comes out. So when we talk about travel demand models, show of hands, anybody know what I'm talking about? OK, great. Well, <laughs> it's more than a black box, I promise you that. Um, but it is, you know, there's lots that goes into it. These are just some definitions that um, different agencies use to try to describe ultimately what it is. Um, it is a computer-based program. Uh, in Texas, we use a software called TransCAD which is what runs the kind of the software underneath. But TxDOT, um, along with their partners at TTI, have developed what is called TexPack, which is a standard tool used in Texas MPOs for the travel demand models. Um, so when we look at the bottom def definition, uh, TPMP uses the travel demand modeling package, uh, Texas package, or TexPack, to help prepare travel forecasts for urban areas in Texas. That's ultimately what it comes down to, the ability to know what's going to happen on your system in the future. There are, in the case of the Lubbock model, there's really three key parts to the model. The first is the trip generation. This is the step in the model that determines why you're going to travel, why people travel every day. Are you going to work? Are you going shopping? Um, what type of activities do you do? And how many trips do you make from your household, depending on your household size and other characteristics? The other side of that is where are you going to go? Are you going to the office type of opportunities, the shopping, employment locations, et cetera? Those trips, once we know how many are created, then trip distribution helps the or is the step in the model where we figure out where they're going. Are you going to go across town to go shopping at Target or Walmart, or are you going to go to the one closer to your home? That's what the trip distribution step does. 
The third component is the external travel, those trips on the interstate, for example. I lost the screens. Are you all still? There we go. Okay. Um, external travel, these are the um, cars and trucks coming from outside the county coming into your region, how they interact. You have some passing right through and others that come into Lubbock for the day, maybe even leave again. Finally, all of these different types of trips are then aggregated and assigned to the network. And that's ultimately where the rubber meets the road. It helps us then estimate the number of vehicles on the roadway and calculate those levels of performance measures, congestion, et cetera. So what can you do with it? Well, there's lots of things you can do with it and lots of things you shouldn't do with it, to be totally honest. Um, things that work really well is that travel demand models are designed to, to look at the region as a whole, um, not necessarily the street in front of your house. So they're very high level, big picture impacts. Um, so what happens with growth projections? What is the VMT? What is the vehicle hours traveled on your system in 20 years? What happens if you know, major road changes? Um, those are the big pictures. They're the input to traffic forecasts, like I said, that uh, TPMP develops. Um, and then they can also be the starting point for more detailed analysis. Mm -hmm. Types of projects that the city or the district are working on, for example, new roadways or frontage road improvements, the model may be the start to developing those types of forecasts. Misuses of regional models, taking that volume in front of your street and using it directly without context. Um, because again, the model is big picture, it works in aggregate, but there's you know, expectation and proper and improper uses of that data. So it's just managing expectations and when to use it, when not to. Um, but ultimately, even with those limitations in mind, it is the perfect tool to ask what if questions. What if we grow at X percent per year in population versus Y? What happens if we are not able to complete projects? Or what happens if we do complete this major project? How does that impact our system? How do we quantify that? That's where the model comes into play. Um, there are limitations to it that have to be aware of. One, it's what we call a macroscopic model, meaning you know, I'm sure you've all, uh, through transportation, seen presentations of little cars zooming around uh, designs, you know, and simulations, etc. That's not what this is. This is more what we call aggregate or macro level. So we're looking at daily conditions in the system as a whole. As part of that, it doesn't necessarily capture the impacts of weaves or um, delays to turn left, for example. Um, that's where this is an input to those types of analysis. So with that in mind, again, it's about setting expectations about how to use the model, where to use it, and then um, where to use it as a starting point for further analysis. So with some of those understandings in mind, what are some popular um, applications of models? And probably the most traditional or um, common use is a network change. This would just be a kind of a, a generic example of, well, what happens if we connect these two locations with a new road, how, what type of volume does it attract, where does the volume come from? Um, this is probably one of the more <coughs> common applications of a travel demand model for understanding new, new systems. But then because it does have a regional perspective, we can then use it to quantify regional performance measures, regional metrics to help support planning. Um, this is another example of just looking at what the changes in uh, delay, for example, would be under different investment scenarios. And these are the types of things that can be done. But then going at looking at the model as a starting point, it can then be used to feed um, many other types of analysis that I know the MPO has in mind of what they can do now with this model. This is an example of a project where we use a model but actually evaluated a, a corridor at a very fine level of detail to quantify the accessibility and um, best use for different types of parcels based on their accessibility. So again, model information being used as a starting point for other types of analysis. 
So with some of the a brief background and probably more questions, hopefully some questions, but if not, um, in mind, you know, that's what a map model is. Now, how did we develop the 2017 Lubbock Travel Demand Model? We've been working on this project for a little bit more than a year. Uh, again, working with TxDOT under a contract. Um, the project was into four phases uh, where we, um, as Tammy mentioned, we were charged with the development of the model inputs. Uh, so working with the MPO, we developed a lot of the input data that fed the model, uh, fed that into TextPack, worked through uh, what we call model validation, and that's where we ensure that the model meets existing conditions before using it for forecast. We then developed the forecast information. And finally, here we are today developing or delivering documentation and training to you all. So a big part of the model development is stitching together or quilting together a large amount of information. Generally falls into four different categories. We have supply data, which is a um, representation of your, of your roadway system. Um, which we use for calculation of travel time and the capacity of the roadways. We have demand data, which is we um, divide the area into what we call traffic analysis zones, uh, which are kind of just arbitrary, but there's lots of reasons how we form them. But within each TAZ, we quantify the households and the employment, which are then used by that trip generation model that we talked about a few minutes ago. And also in each TAZ, we have enrollment uh, for not just uh, K through 12, but also track um, the, the elephant in the corner here, which is the university, which is a big part of travel in your region. Then we have a third component called calibration data. This is the information we use to develop the model and establish those mathematical relationships. So thanks to TxDOT, that has a very robust data collection program um, that's, was, that's, I think, Tammy, ongoing or the recent data collection program is ongoing or completed recently? Data no, the surveys and everything for the... Um, yes, well, love it. Well, you think we just David, oh, Martin, did we just have the meeting where we... We um, just kicked it off. So yeah. It's ongoing right now. So as, as we're here delivering a model, we're already preparing for the next model with new data collection. But um, some pieces that go into that, if you were lucky enough to be in the household travel survey, where you actually had somebody call you up and ask you how many trips your household makes during the day, et cetera. They survey special generators, things like the university, how many trips are attracted every day. And then on the external um, movements, we have uh, an opportunity to use you know, the big data uh, that Texas has access to, and that's where we're able to understand the through movements for the region. All that information along with the input data is then tied together in the model, and then we use the validation data, which is the last data set to actually assess how well the model is working. Um, we use this term digital twin often in travel demand modeling, and this is basically what we've developed is a digital representation of your region, um, including the demographics, which are your households, your socioeconomic data, the employment, and then also your roadway system. Um, this is, we use what we call functional class to basically develop a hierarchy of the roadway system. You have your interstates going all the way down to your local streets. So each of those different types of roadways has different characteristics, uh, speed, capacity, et cetera, so that when we make the route choice in the model, we know which are the preferred or better routes versus the longer routes. So those things are developed kind of represent that electronic version of your region. We then put this all into the black box. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the workflow is managed by what we call TextPack, which is TextDot's MPO model. Uh, it's a custom set of programs that run in TransCAD, again, which is the software. Uh, if you're interested, we'll be doing some training about it this afternoon if you'd like to come see what uh, TransCAD looks like. But the model um, executes the model steps using the prepared inputs and calibration data, as I mentioned. 
Um, I'm a travel demand model, which means my presentations always have to have a flow chart. Uh, those, the one on the right is a little bit more complex than what is in the Lubbock model, but it's a good example of how the different pieces flow together. Finally, uh, once we put the inputs and the calibration data together, we then do what is called validation, which is running the model iteratively and making adjustments until we're able to replicate the observed conditions, in this case, the travel, the traffic counts collected on the system. That validated model is then applied to the future years. So we're holding the behavioral assumptions um, constant and then inputting future uh, demographics and roadway network and seeing how the model performs. So in terms of the validation itself, these are some metrics, um, just a small piece of what comes out of the model. Some of the key numbers that we look at are the percent error or how well the model is doing on each of those different roadway classes. And then we also stratify the area into what we call area type. So we have the CBD, which is the downtown area, versus your urbanized area, which is the high density, suburban, and then rural. And then we um, judge the model's performance in each of those areas, among many other things. But these, um, we develop these reports, work with TxDOT to ensure the model is what we call consider validated. Um, and then that's what gives the model confidence to be used in the future. So once we have that uh, validated model, we then begin work on the future year models uh, with developments of model inputs for both the interim and future years, uh, which allows the MPO then to use it for the planning process. In developing the highway network, uh, we worked with the MPO to pull together um, the background projects, which include things in the TIP, local projects, and then also the projects in the long range plan that are committed. This establishes their base scenario and allows them to then um, develop performance measures and needs analysis to identify new projects in the future. The land use projections um, on the TAZ side, we developed the households and employment, again, for those forecast years. But we worked very closely with the MPO um, to ensure that the areas of growth were identified so that the uh, forecast makes sense to the region. So again, just some pictures of where the different projects were identified. Um, most of these areas look, should look very uh, familiar to you all in terms of these different types of projects that are already included in the model network. On the household side, the maps show the areas of change uh, between 2022 and then out to 2050. Um, and again, this was uh, done collaboratively with the MPO to understand where there were growth areas anticipated. And then similar looking maps with where the expected employment is to grow uh, out into the future. Everybody seems a little interested in those maps. We'll give you a minute to digest. <laughs> The darker the color, the denser the population or denser the employment. The more growth assigned to that more, TAZ. Yeah. So the growth density is, is higher. So obviously bigger zones you know, hold more employees, so there may be more employees going to those areas. Um, Madam Chair. Yes, sir. So just a, just a quick explanation. The, the, the chart on the left is 2022 which would be this year, and then what we're projecting in the next 28 years. Correct. So the, the model was um, developed with a 2017 base year so that we um, developed it to replicate 2017 conditions. And then the forecast years that we were scoped developed were 2022 and 2050. Wow. That's interesting. So it's shaking that magic eight ball, seeing what comes out. But... <laughs> Now, the, the nice thing about the model is these are a starting point, um, and that's why it is a great tool for the continuous planning process in that as things change, as developments come online, um, as project priorities change, Martin and his team can then adjust the model um, and rerun it very quickly, and that's what, you know, the, the power of it to understand how things change, what those impacts are. 
So for example, um, you know, new developments, a new major employer comes to the region, able to plug that in and understand what impacts that may have. Did that answer the question, sir, about the map? I believe it did. Yeah. All right, so um, understanding a little bit of how the process was done, we just wanna talk a little bit about some of the many ways it can be used and what can be extracted from the model to help inform the planning process. So as I mentioned, there's um, two main types of scenarios or things that can be uh, adjusted in the model in addition to the behavioral assumptions. But the first are the network changes. Um, what types of things would you do to the roadway system? Um, so you have roadway additions that may be a new roadway um, connecting, you know, a, a, a gap in the network or a new facility, um, you know, greenfield type of roadway projects. You can also have roadway reductions. Um, roadway diets or um, for whatever reason losing lanes because of adding bike facilities for example or other things the model is sensitive to not only additional capacity but reduction of capacity can also be used for um, resiliency analysis for example what is the impact of a major structure um, being closed for a period of time how does the system respond and then thirdly is configuration changes, whether that be upgrading a facility to a higher functional class with higher speeds, or example of adjusting the ramp orientation on a, on a corridor. Those are the types of things that can be done on the network side. On the land use, um, looking at changes in the household characteristics, you can um, new subdivisions, new major apartment complexes, you know, adding those to the zone, seeing the impacts to trip generation. And then on the flip side, new employment centers, um, whether that be magnitude of employment, but also type of employment, um, because a basic type of or a small warehousing industrial facility has a different characteristic than a new target complex. Um, so the model is sensitive to being able to run those types of scenarios. Once you define the scenario, you're able then to run the model and do comparisons, the what if, and quantify those benefits. Um, we can look at things like network performance, um, where have we alleviated deficiencies, have we improved level of service, um, and then also system-wide performance measures. If it's a large-scale project, have we made the system more efficient? less delay, um, less VMT as we look at, you know, trying to um, environmental goals, et cetera. And then also you can get down to who actually uh, using the project and things called select link. So those are some of the types of examples. The model, uh, again, it is a generator of big data, um, can generate all kinds of information and pictures, which can be very helpful in telling the story. Uh, these are some examples of some built-in tools and text pack for displaying outputs from the network. The, you can color the different links by various characteristics, how things change, for example, between two different scenarios. You can color things for level of service, um, volume, et cetera. TextPack also has a um, built-in reporting capability, both in Excel and an HTML report, which generates statistics on just about every step in the model, um, including the outputs. So we're able to quickly look at, say, vehicle miles of traveled by freeways in the urban area, for example, and compare that to different scenarios. The HTML report, this gets into some pretty pictures. Uh, these were some uh, tools developed by TxDOT and TTI. We're able to visualize some of the model. Um, I really like this one. Let's see if you can see my mouse. This is a great uh, diagram of looking at how traffic interacts between the external stations. Um, so just some, some really cool tools to help answer questions. Um, it's, it's a 
open sandbox for you to ask questions and then Martin to come back with answers. <laughs> Again, some other uh, types of tools. These are maps called desire lines. We're able to pick actual um, areas in the model and understand who is actually um, coming to those different areas or where they're coming from, for example. So you can understand travel patterns to downtown or the university, for example. Um, this is what we call Select Link, which is a very helpful tool. We use it often in developing project level forecasts where we're able to pick a specific link in the network um, or a zone and then actually track those users throughout the system. So we can pick a link, um, say, outside where we are today and understand um, where the different vehicles are coming from throughout the region. And then um, some things, some really crazy stuff. You can do some 3D mapping, which show, you know, you can use that vertical access to show, you know, whatever you're interested in, in terms of density or trips, employment centers, et cetera. And then the bottom is what we call travel time bands. Uh, you can identify um, accessibility to different um, measures, depending on what you're studying. So if you wanted to understand for example, the travel time from fire stations. Uh, you can use the travel demand model network to calculate that, and then you were able to quantify, for example, how those things may change, or schools, hospitals, et cetera. And these are very often types of performance measure, measures that may be used in a plan. So uh, that was hopefully an interesting taste and gave you some thoughts on different questions and things that can now um, the MPO can help assist with. Uh, where we're headed next um, is the model itself is going to be rolled out. Do you want to? Yeah. Sure. So, sorry. I, I'm going to give you a real example real quick, if you don't mind, to kind of help you out uh, to kind of visualize what's, what you can kind of utilize this for. So this here, really quick, you take a look at this select link. You take a look at it, and you, you think, it's just a bunch of lines on the map, right? <laughs> um, and for you, it, it really doesn't uh, speak all that much. But for us, it, it tells a story. And so you're, it's up to you as an elected official and in, as your staff to come to us and say, uh, we're thinking of, of changing Broadway, right? And the last time you, you spoke about out loud about you know changing Broadway, there, there was an outcry in the whole district, right? Or you could say, we're thinking about really just upgrading Woodrow Road. Or, you know, say, we're, we're, we're pondering if we should really build Loop 88, right? We've already answered all these questions for you in the past, but let's pretend that we, were, we hadn't answered those questions quite yet. And you're coming to us and you say, we're, gonna, we're ready to spend $30 million on improvement of roadways, and this is the roadway that we think we're going to improve. This model, we would come in and we would select those links for that roadway network that we're gonna improve. And then we're gonna then run the model and have it spit out this report. And this report will tell us, one, if it makes us more efficient or less efficient, and two, in what ways. And then what you can also do on there is you can kind of take a look and you can use this desire line map to say how many people will actually utilize it. Are they really gonna come in and, and go and utilize that roadway? And so when you take a look at this, what, what's the thing that spam stands out to you right now when you're taking a look at that, that line work right there? Right? It's traveling into town, basically on US 84, Marshall Sharp. It's, you, know, you, you can automatically, you don't even have to know what words are on there, right? There's no labeling on there. But just by taking a look at those lines, you can kind of say, how are people accessing Lubbock, right? And, and not just Lubbock, but Lubbock, the whole region. All the MPO, you know, are you coming in from Wolfworth and are you really going to take, you know, Loop 88 and go all the way around, hit 87, go up I-27 just to hit downtown, or are you going to use, you know, Marshall Sharp? And so this, this right here really gives you a good idea of how are your constituents trying to access what major centers you have. And, and so the interesting thing is when I walked into today, I saw all the pretty maps you guys have paid somebody to create for you, right? out there for the UDC. All those land uses are built into this model. But I bet you if I were to take a look at some of those proposed land uses right now, they're really different from what's inside our model. And so now the question becomes, 
What if those land uses become real? What does it do, do to this tra traffic distribution? What does it do to your traffic downtown? Does it do to your traffic to, for your neighborhoods? Does it improve it? Does it kill it? Right? Because th that's a big question sometimes from an ec economic standpoint. Does it really improve our economic standing here in the region? Does it attract national attention? Right? We, we were able to bring in a cheese factory. Why? Because we had capacity on the east side. Not only land use, but we also had it from, from a uh, transportation distribution. So those are just kind of thoughts for you to kind of just have sit in your mind on what can we utilize this model for? Because this model is only good as we use it, right? It's a tool. And so we can hang up the tool and we can never use it. And it could just be, it could be a good tool that just collects rust and dust and, or we can kind of put it to work and, and actually use it, utilize it to either go search for grant funding or you utilize it to make sure that we're utilizing the dollars that you've given us in the most efficient way. I have a question, Mr. Martin, before you leave. In thinking of uh, the public transportation, could this model be utilized in determining what routes to create? Or, or when we look at how the bus routes are used, does it come up on this model differently? So um, it would be a good starting point for that. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a mode split in this model, okay. but what we could do is we could then generate the what if question, and then we can go ahead and take it one more step and actually get a consultant team on board or a model team on board to be able to give us the mode split, and then they would take out those trips, and then we would remove those trips from the matrix, and then we run the model one more time to see how the level of service improved. And so there would be one additional step, but this would be the starting point for that exact question. Thank and you. so Chris's team, they, they've actually taken a look at um, where new routes should go, and they're currently taking a look at where new routes should go. Once they determine where those new routes should be going, we would then take the uh, assumption of, okay, if you go there, how many trips are you actually gonna carry every day, right? And Chris's team has an idea of how many routes carry so many trips and we would take those trips out of the network for that you know for that proportion and then we would rerun it and say has it improved or hasn't it not and then we can kind of answer that what if question thank you very yeah. much the flip side of that is chris this provides you a tool to like where do i need routes where are the travel mm -hmm. patterns yeah and so it, it could either be the beginning or the end but either way it does it need to be asked and this tool needs to be used in that scenario. Yes. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Well, I, I think Martin did a great job of uh, tying things up. But uh, again, it was a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, happy to answer any more questions. Um, as I mentioned, we are in town doing training uh, with the MPO and others this afternoon to help get the model established and get the, the process running. Uh, as Tammy mentioned and Martin, uh, there's an ongoing data collection program to continually update and keep um, the model advancing in the region. So, thank you. Thank you so much for being here and providing this information. It's a, it's a, lo it's a load. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, Mr. Jones, is it my understanding that we have some folks who will actually be attending the training this afternoon. Yes, we have. Uh, we well, Martin has extended an invitation to uh, some of the city's GIS personnel, some of the city's traffic engineering personnel, uh, either some Texas Tech uh, engineering uh, people are interested, and they'll be adjourning from here and going to our office and actually for a training session be two training sessions today so um, if you want to if you want to come by and get your get your hands wet on some software we'll come over to the MPO office and we'll give you a computer what times what time is that mr. Jones I know we'll have some takers today so I, I want to make sure they know. <laughs> the be there. so we'll be adjourning here and we'll be attending that those two trainings and those two trainings will be happening at 1030. That 1030 will actually take this 3000 foot level, you know, kind of taking a look at there and we'll actually be taking a look at some scenario planning and take it down to about 
the thousand foot level at 1030. And so they'll kind of give them an idea of if you were to change land use to say in downtown, what would happen then to the trip generation? Or if we were to take loop 289 and switch the ramps, what would happen? And, and how that might improve some of the uh, interactions that we're having down south on some of those uh, some of those roadways that we frequently get calls on. And um, those, that was a actual plan that we took a look at back in 94, I believe, of uh, doing some ramp improvements down on the South Loop. Um, we just haven't moved forward with that. And so we're actually taking using this model to actually take a look at what if on that one at 1030. And then um, we'll adjourn for lunch. We'll come back at one and we'll actually shrink down the group to the actual ones who will actually be maintaining the model. And so these are the people who are going to be in the weeds actually making the link changes and, and trying to break the model while we have our consultant team to tell us why we broke it and how we broke it and not to do what we just did kind of thing. So uh, much like a car, you can give it a tune-up. Uh, a lot of us backyard mechanics know how to change oil. But as soon as you tell us to go ahead and change the rack and pinion, uh, we might either get squashed or we might put it on and, and we might get down the road and it might fall, a wheel might fall off because we didn't change those lug nuts right. And so and so we want to kind of make sure that we, uh, we, we break it in their presence so that way they can help us understand how we broke it and why we broke it. And so those are kind of the... the the levels of, of training that we'll have today. Uh, we were really specific on who we invited. Um, so we do have our regional partners. Um, in addition to those that uh, uh, David Jones indicated, we also invited SPAG, our, our rural uh, regional planning partner. We'll have uh, TechSot there as well. Um, we invited um, some of our uh, local uh, council governments as well, some of their members who are on various economic boards to come and see at that 1,000 foot level if they wanted to view it and participate as well. And so we, we sent the invitation out to, I want to say, about 30 individuals for that 1030 meeting. We have 24 that accepted. And then we told uh, about eight of them that they can show up for that third training. And we'll see how it goes from there. So, But more the merrier. If you really want to come in and, and, and understand a little bit more, we always welcome you. And if you think that you don't want to rub elbows with that many individuals, that's fine. You tell us when you'd like to come by, and we'll give you a tour of the model um, once we have it on our MPO computers. Thank you so much, Mr. Martin. And I know this is the point where we have our reports from Mr. Jones. It's kind of been a long morning, so if it's okay with the rest of the uh, members of the committee, if we could just take that monthly financial report and then call it a day, is that okay? Yes, ma'am. The very last page in your agenda backup is the financial report. Through February are the 42nd percentile. We are 82% collected on our revenue at this point and 34% on our expenses, so we're in good shape. And unless you have any questions, that'd be my report. Any questions? None. I just want to say a good thank you to everybody that came today. We knew that it was going to be a little bit longer than what we were used to, but glad that you all made your way to this place and got that information that we've been provided with. If there's nothing else or nothing else I need to do, we'll be adjourned. Thank you for your presence. We appreciate you being here.